Hebrews 13, 15 through 18. Through him then, let us continually offer, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing fruit with such sacrifice as God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over, you, over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for, for we are sure that we have good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. Uh, thank you for that reading. Um, let's, let's look back at that again, kind of start out. Um, I'm titling this lesson, Christian Conduct in the New Year. Um, I mean, we could just stay with these verses that, he, that Nolan just read for us and be done. But there's a couple other things I want to look a little more in depth with. But let's, let's look at that again. Hebrews uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of the lips, and give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with, su with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, uh, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. So this is kind of just a good starting out point for uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, as was mentioned, we just got done with Thanksgiving, and we start thinking around that time. Hopefully we do it all the time, but that time of year specifically, we think about what we're thankful for. We're thankful for our family. We're thankful for the roof over our head. We're thankful for the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the car that we drive, the basic necessities that we have that we're thankful for. But then just a couple or about a month and a week later, we start thinking about the new year and we want to make New Year's resolutions, or at least some of us do. Some of us know that we're terrible at keeping them, so why make them? But uh, we still like to think of what the positive things can be for the new year that we can work on. Um, we, as uh, the preachers and elders and deacons here, uh, always come up with what we want the theme or what the want the goal to be throughout the year uh, coming up. And so we just think about what's coming up, what we want to do. And so I just kind of wanted to look at today how we should conduct ourselves. We can have goals. We... Uh, want to do better at something, do less of other things, things like that. But how are we called to conduct ourselves as Christians? This doesn't have to wait until the new year. This can start today. This should start today. This is how we should conduct ourselves uh, throughout our entire lives. But I just wanted to look at four points that seem easy enough, but there are things that are a lot easier said than done. So we'll start with the first one that we need to be thankful. If you'll go ahead and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. We just got done celebrating Thanksgiving. We had food. We may have had friends and family. But we're, we just need to make sure that we are thankful for everything that we have. And we know that everything that we have is from God. Um, we looked at, I think, I believe it was two weeks ago, uh, verse 17, we're commanded to pray without ceasing, and then immediately following that in verse 18, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now that doesn't say, for the things that make you happy, for the things that are easy, give thanks. This says, give thank in everything give thanks. We need to be thankful for the things that we have. We need to be thankful for the things that we go through. We will suffer. We will go through hard times, but we can grow from those things. We can grow from those hard times. And we're commanded there in verse 18, in everything give thanks. 
And he doesn't just stop it there. He tells us why. For this, in God, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to give thanks. God wants us to live lives that we can be proud of, the things that we can have, that we can benefit from ourselves, but also to benefit others, to help them out. Uh, so we need to be thankful in everything. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 15. Helps if I get to the right chapter. Um, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the words of Christ, the word of Christ, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So the word thankful is used many times here. Uh, Verse 15 at the very end, it says, and be thankful. But right before that, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. The peace of Christ. That is something we should all strive for. That is something we should all attain to have in our hearts. He gives it to us through uh, his sacrifice that he made for each and every one of us that we've been studying all this last year, and that especially uh, we're into the area of, of the uh, his crucifixion this week. But he did that because he loves us, and he wants us to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Well, how do we do that? We need to know what the Bible says. Well, how we do that is we read the Bible. We know what we can be thankful for. We know that we can let the word of Christ dwell in us by reading God's word. God gave it to us not just to say do this and don't do this, but he gave us his word to be able to be thankful for the things that we have, to know where those things came from, and to just be continually reminded of the love that he has for us and that we should have for one another. Continuing there in verse 16, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we just did. We sang together with each other, with our hearts, with thankfulness in our hearts to God. Now, this does not say sing on key 100% 100% of the time. Trust me, we don't care. I, I tell this story when we lived in Arkansas when we were going to college. There was this sweet old lady that, man, she sang her heart, her heart out. And it was difficult sometimes because none of it was in key. But, man, you knew she meant every word of what she was singing. So we need to pay attention to what we are singing. We need to sing with all of our heart and be thankful in our heart and sing and talk to one another. So we need to be thankful, but we also need to be cheerful. Give an example back here in Job. Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9 and verse 27. We know everything that Job went through. He did not have an easy time. He lost everything. He had boils on his body. His friends were telling him, his wife told him to uh, rebuke God and die. And he just wasn't having a good time. But in chapter 9 verse 27, it says, Though I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. We don't go through the stuff that Job went through by any comparison. We go through bad things. We go through hard times. But we also go through good times. We have good things happen to us, to our loved ones, and to those around us. And if Job, from this story, 
can even say, I will leave off my sad countenance and be cheerful. I think we can do the same. We know everything that he went through. And I don't know about you guys, but I haven't had boils all over my body. I haven't lost every member of my family. I haven't lost all livestock, all of his livelihood, everything like that. But he can still be cheerful, so so can I. Um, just for a note in the New King James Version, uh, instead of be cheerful, it says, I will leave off my sad countenance and wear a smile. Did you know that if you wake up and force yourself to smile, you'll have a happier day? Studies have shown. It's, it, you, you start your day off with your brain thinking, I'm going to be happy today. So if you wake up wearing a smile, you will have a better day. You'll have a better attitude about the day. And you'll just be more cheerful throughout that day. Next, let's, let's look at Romans chapter 12. And I'm sure you've all heard the scientific study. I don't know the numbers, but it takes like, what, four muscles to smile and like 20-something or more to frown. So it's a whole lot easier to smile. So smiling is a good thing. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the pr uh, proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we've studied these. We've studied these traits that we can have. Um, we took the... That would have been four years ago, maybe, that we took the spiritual giftedness tests. Um, and there were things that we scored higher in, but that doesn't mean that's our only thing that we can do. It just means that we may need to work a little harder than some on the other ones. But we need to do all of this with cheerfulness. There in verse 8, it says, uh, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So those two go together, showing mercy with cheerfulness. But I kind of like to think about doing all of these things with cheerfulness. If you are going through using your gifts, whether you're uh, serving or teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, or showing mercy, those things are a whole lot easier to do if you're cheerful about it. If you're happy to do it, if you're willing to do it, those things come more naturally, um, and it's just easier to do. So we need to focus on when we do the things that we do, whether that's teaching or exhorting or preaching, things like that, that we need to be cheerful about it. It shouldn't feel like a chore. It shouldn't feel like a job. It should feel like something that we get to do, that we should be happy, that we have the opportunity to do that, because not everybody has that opportunity. We need to count ourselves blessed that we do have the opportunity to do the things that we are doing. And finally, under being cheerful, uh, James 5 and verse 13. James 5 and verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. You know how we sing the song sometimes with the kids, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Why, why do we say that? Well, because we want to show that happiness. We want to show that cheerfulness that we have and let others around us know that we're happy and that we're cheerful. I've got to be, be a little careful because my next point is be happy, and I don't want to get too far into that one because um, they're kind of similar. But if we're happy, if you're, excuse me, if we're cheerful... Um, it says that we are to sing praises. We can let other people know that we're cheerful, and singing praises can bring cheer to other people. When people hear you singing, I know that I get a lot, just a lot of encouragement when I hear anybody singing. It could be one person, it could be a hundred people, it could be a thousand people. 
But when you hear singing together, it just makes you happy. It makes, I keep saying happy, it makes you cheerful. Um, and it just, it puts a smile on your face. So we need to make sure that when we're cheerful, that we need to sing praises. So we're to be thankful now and in, in this upcoming year. We are to be cheerful and then we are to be happy. Flip back with me again to Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. So this one's a little different to think about. But how happy is the man whom God reproves, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Think about when we discipline our kids. Why do we do that? It's not because we want to be big, bad, mean, tough guy. It's because we love them. We love them and we want them to learn from these things and we need them to be happy. And to do that, they need to understand the right and the wrong ways to do things. So we need to be happy even if we get reproof from God. If we get discipline from God, we need to take that, we need to learn from that, and we need to apply that to our lives so that we're able to be happy. If we're constantly doing things that go against God's will, that go against what God has told us, we're not going to live a happy life. People in the world want to tell you that you can have a happy life going out, spending all the money you want, drinking, doing drugs, everything like that. But that's not what God has told us to do. God has told us to follow his will. And when he rebukes us or gives us uh, discipline, we learn from that so that we can live a truly happy life through him. And then flipping back to the New Testament in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. Right before this, uh, the start of chapter 10, is when the 70 are sent out. So they come back and they, they're very happy. It says uh, The chapter heading in mine, at least, says the happy results. So they're happy about this. In verse 17, it says, The 70 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they went out and they saw the things that they could do in God's name and they were happy about it because even the demons were subject to them in God's name. So from that we should take that when we do things that God has told us to do in his name that there's nothing that we can't do. As long as we're following his will, we can uh, go out and teach his love and his word and what he has done for us and what he wants us to do and be happy about it. But not only will we ourselves be happy because people are listening, but we'll make others happy. There's, there's nothing in the world that should make us happier than reading God's word, learning what he has done for us, learning uh, what he will do for us continually, and learning of the home in heaven that we have prepared for each and every one of us. That should be the happiest story that we ever read and God has given it all to us right here in his Bible. So we should be thankful, we should be cheerful, we should be happy. And what's the easiest way to do all of that? Is to be together. Being together with like-minded people, with people who love God, who love each other, is the easiest way to do all of these things. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Being together should bring joy, it should bring happiness, it should bring anticipation. I'll tell a story about my daughter about every single day of the week. She says, Daddy, can we go to Bible class? Can we go to Bible class? She's so excited to be here. She loves Bible class so much, and that says a lot about her teachers, but it says a lot just about her love for going and being together with people. So Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20 says, For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. 
we should want nothing more than God to be there with us. And he says, where two or more, or two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Well, two or three requires more than one. So we need to be together. We need to uh, be together for worship. We need to be together for studies. We need to be together just fellowshipping with one another. So the easiest way to do all this is to be together with one another. Uh, Flip over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, starting in verse 15, says, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So the point I want to make here is how do we know if somebody is without clothing? Or if somebody is without food, if we're not together, if we don't have a way to connect with each other, if we don't have a way to contact each other, we can, we can call each other, we can email or text each other or Facebook Messenger each other, but coming together is the best way to understand the needs of what everybody, uh, the needs that everybody has. So if we come together, we can share those things with one another it's not a negative thing. If we need things, if we need help, if we need assistance, we need to come to each other. But we can't do that if we're alone. We need to do that by being together and talking with each other and uh, just sharing things with each other. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, starting in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. But if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. This brought me, brought back a memory of when we were, I think we were working on the projector or cabling or something, and Johnny texted me and said, did everything go okay? I said, yep. Are you making sure I'm not laying on the floor? And he said, yep. <laughs> we need to check on each other. We need to make sure, and, and right after that, he, he was here. I wasn't actually on the scaffolding when uh, he had texted that. But if something happens to one person, we won't know that unless we're together, unless we check on them. Um, verse, uh, it says that in verse 10, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. We don't want to be in that, in that situation where we fall and we can't get up. Verse 11, uh, furthermore, if two lie down uh, together, they can keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? We can be warm together. And then in verse 12, and if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. It's hard sometimes to get by one person, but it's easier than two people. And it's most definitely easier than three people, but if we stick together, if we stay together, uh, and we share that bond, it is, uh, as it says, is not quickly torn apart. Two more. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. So when he wrote this letter, they were doing, they were doing the right things. He says, just as you are also doing. But we need to make sure that we are doing this today. We need to make sure that we are uh, coming together 
with each other. And if we're not, we need to find out why. We need to reach out to those that may not be here, those that we may not have seen in a while, or even if this is the first week they've missed, we should be reaching out to them, not just one person, not just two people, but we should, we should all reach out to them and say, hey, we missed you. Is there anything that you need? We need to be together. We need to share our lives with each, with each other to understand um, what the needs are. And if something's going on, we can lend a hand. We can reach out to them and we can help them however we can. But it says there in verse 11, encourage one another and build up one another. Again, you can't do that if you're alone, if you're by yourself. But when we come together, we have every opportunity to build each other up and to encourage each other. So finally, we'll go back to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So again, it comes back to encouragement. It comes back to connecting with each other, to being, being there for each other. Uh, verse 24, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Everybody's got a different way of how they may show love. But we have the example that God gives us, that Jesus gave us through his coming to earth and sacrificing himself for us, that we can base that love off of, that we are to show others, that we are to uh, stimulate one another to. It says, and to good deeds. We can do things for each other. We all have busy lives. But a phrase that I, I will always remember that my mom said that I think she got, I don't remember who she got it from, but we all had the same 24 hours. Everybody's got the same amount of time in the day. And yes, we are busy, but we need to take time to reach out and to be with one another, to talk with one another, and to encourage one another. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. We don't know when that is, but we are promised that it is coming. So we need to be prepared. We need to encourage one another. We need to be together at every opportunity that we can so that we can encourage one another. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes things happen in our lives. We understand that. But we need to uh, be together, be a part of the body here, the body of Christ, as we have all uh, made that commitment through our baptism to Jesus through his death that we need to make sure that we are not forsaking our own assembling together. We went to Texas last week to uh, see family and uh, let some of them meet the little ones that they hadn't met yet. We went, to, we went to worship there, but I still felt sad. I wasn't here. It's just this is what we're used to. It was great to be able to worship there and to uh, see people I haven't seen in a while and to meet some new people and to introduce them to the family. But it wasn't home. But through the body of Christ, every place that we go with his body is home. So we need to make sure that we're constantly encouraging each other and being together. So for this new year, these may be things that you've been working on or things that you might think, I need to work on that a little more. I think all of us could always work on everything uh, listed here and even more, um, just a little bit more. Put effort into it. But we can be thankful about every single day. We'll have hard days. We'll have good days, but let's be thankful for every single day that we have. Let's be cheerful 
about every day that we have. Again, there are hard times. There, there are some bad things going on in this world. But let's be cheerful about the things that we have, the abilities that we have to share God's word with those around us, those all the way across the world. Let's be cheerful. Let's also be happy. Try this with me. For the next week, every, every day that you wake up, as soon as you wake up, I want you to smile and see if your day's better. I know it's a scientifically proven fact. I've tried it. It does work. So spoiler alert, it does work. But try that for the next week and even longer than that. But wake up every morning and smile and say, I'm going to have a good day. I'm going to be happy about today. Things will happen. People will maybe make you angry, make you upset, make you sad. But start the day off saying, I will be happy. And finally, let's continue to be together. We want to be together. We want to see each and every one of you as many times as possible. We've got jobs. We've got school. But this is the most important family that we have. This family here through Jesus that we have. We want to be together with everyone as much and as often as possible. It's not easy, but it's not the hardest thing in the world either. A lot of it has to do with mindset. A lot of it has to do with studying God's word, and he tells us exactly how to do all of that. So if you need help with any of those things, if you've been struggling with them and would like to talk with someone about it, or if there's something else going on in your lives uh, that you need to talk about, that you need prayers of the church for, uh, we highly encourage you to come and talk with us and to let us know so that we can pray with you and just surround you with that, the love that God has given us and show you uh, that we're here for you. If we can help you in any way, please come while we stand and sing.